Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the School Wellness Council webinar. We're going to begin at this time. I'm sure we'll have a few more people join us throughout the uh, presentation here. But uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, come and listen to us. Today we have three presenters. My name is Matt Dietz, and I'm a project manager here at the Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. I'm joined by Allison Lipson Simpson, also at Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center, as well as our special guest today, David Genova from the Pottstown School District, who will share his expertise working with school wellness councils. As always, this webinar would not be possible without the support from our funders. Funding was provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Health through the State Public Health Actions to Prevent and Control Diabetes, Heart Disease, Obesity, and Associated Risk Factors and Promote School Health Federal Grant as well as uh, the Preventive Health and Health Services Block Grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We'd like to give a special thanks to our, thanks to our partners to the PA Department of Health for their contributions to this webinar. A few housekeeping points before we get started. All participants are muted. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question or a comment for the question and answer session at the end of the webinar, you can enter that question into the questions box now, and we will get to look at them later. Uh, we'll reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer all submitted questions, and if not, we will get back to you uh, in a timely manner. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording and handouts will be emailed following the webinar, as well as a link to a certificate of completion and follow-up survey will be included. So please be on the lookout for these items in your inboxes, and we look forward to your feedback. We have a fairly loaded agenda this afternoon. The key items, items that we will cover during the session include an overview of the Pro Wellness Center, what are wellness councils? Why are wellness councils useful for school health initiatives? Wellness council composition, the general makeup, and who you should invite, as well as some expert lessons learned from the Pottstown School District. And we have three main learning objectives for today. Uh, at the end of this webinar, attendees should be able to understand the importance of wellness councils for health and wellness initiatives in your school or district. Uh, two, to identify potential wellness council members in your school or district, and three, to recognize strategies for establishing and sustaining a wellness council. And like we've already said before, you'll have the benefit of learning from David Genova, who comes to us from a very well-established health and wellness council in his district. So a little bit more information about the center for those of you on the webinar for the first time today. Uh, here at Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center, we are committed to educating and inspiring youth and their families to eat well, engage in regular physical activity, and become champions for bringing healthy choices to life. The vision of our center is to reduce the incidence rate of childhood obesity. We aim to be the trusted resource for educational programming, collaborative partnerships, and proven interventions in schools, communities, and like-minded organizations. Uh, in 2014, we have worked with over 400 schools in some capacity, and we pride ourselves on being a great resource for the schools and their partners. And in case you're wondering, the PRO and PRO Wellness stands for Prevention, Research, and Outreach. Uh, examples of all of these great resources are available on our website at pennstatehershey.org slash PRO Wellness. Uh, also included on our website is the opportunity to sign up for a Healthy Champion program, and you qualify if you're a community-based organization or a school. And I'll cover more here. So our Healthy Champions program is available for schools and community-based organizations in Pennsylvania and includes various resources like event planning guides, promotional templates, customized school champion reports, future funding priority, uh, Hershey Bears Incentives, which that's a kind of a local organization around here with us, but if you're in Pennsylvania, I'm sure you probably have heard of them, uh, as well as general health tips and a monthly newsletter that comes out. Uh, to register as a healthy champion, again, you can please visit our website at www.pennstatehershey.org slash prowellness slash champs. Uh, annual registration is required to receive your welcome toolkit at the beginning of each school year. Currently, because we're already so far into the school year, it's closed, but we'll open again in the spring, I believe it's April, for the 2015-2016 school year. And all these resources are free upon sign-up. So including in your uh, Healthy Champions Welcome Kit, you will find uh, promotional items for our four events. We have two events in the fall and two events in the spring, uh, one of one physical activity and one nutrition uh, in both, both time periods. And those are the Walk to School Day in October, Apple Crunch also in October, Go for the Greens, which is a healthy eating uh, promotion program, and that happens in March, and Move It Outside in April when it gets nice and sunny out. Now I'll pass the presentation over to my colleague, Allison Lipson, so she can share more information about school wellness councils, uh, kind of the whole purpose of this webinar. Go ahead, Allie. Thanks, Matt. So what is a wellness council? 
According to guidance from Let's Move, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and a school, a school wellness council is a group focused on the health and well-being of students and staff that concerns itself with assessing the school's health status, guiding school health policies, and coordinating activities on health topics. That's a rather broad definition, so let's dig down a little bit deeper. Many schools already have functioning advisory councils or committees that focus on one or more aspects of a healthy school environment. These may include health education curriculum, safety, student support, and others. Convening a wellness council to address nutrition and physical activity in your school or district may be as simple as expanding the mission of a current group. Schools will find it helpful to implement councils at both the district and school building levels. The Alliance for a Healthier Generation says that a district-level wellness council focuses on policy and the common mission of district health and wellness programs. They identify gaps and locate district and community resources to address them. For instance, a district-level council may evaluate the implementation of district nutrition policies. They may also review and recommend a staff wellness program. A school-level wellness council focuses on the nutrition and physical activity needs of students and staff in a specific building and implements programs and activities to meet these needs. For example, a school wellness council might begin a walking program for students and staff to engage in regular physical activity. These school wellness councils may go by other names, including health council or wellness committee. In fact, when you hear from our guest speaker a little bit later, you'll hear him refer to his group as a wellness committee. What you call your council is up to you, but what's important is the work that these groups are doing within your school and your district. So why are wellness councils important? They bring school staff, families, students, and community members together to address pressing student health issues. They advise the school board or the district on school and community health issues. They coordinate efforts and programs that exist in the district and the community. They identify successes in the district or school to increase support for future programs, and they monitor and evaluate the implementation of district health and wellness policies and programs. Wellness councils utilize a comprehensive systems approach to school health in areas such as access to healthier foods, opportunities for physical activity, and staff wellness programs. The School Wellness Council is a way to inform students, teachers, staff, and families about current issues regarding health and wellness in the school or the district. So now that we've talked a little bit about Wellness Council, what it is, why it's important, we'd like to hear from you through the poll that we launched on your screen. So take a minute and select the answer that most closely aligns with the, your Wellness Council meeting schedule. We'd like to know how often your Wellness Council meets per year. So we'll give you a minute to go ahead and answer that. Looks like we're slowing down on our responses here. We'll give you another minute to go ahead, and, or another second here to answer, and we'll go ahead and we can share those results with you. Looks like for the majority of you that answered, you are meeting four or more times per year, which is fantastic because we found that some of the most active wellness councils meet monthly, but meeting at least four times per year will help ensure your group is moving toward your priorities forward. If your wellness council isn't as active, you'll learn about ways to engage them during this webinar. So as you get ready to convene a wellness council or add to the mission of a current group, you'll want to think strategically about the types of people you want to have at the table. You want to look for people that have a demonstrated interest in healthy youth and staff, those that have knowledge, skills, and resources, whether at the organization level or the individual level, a willingness to devote time to regular meetings, those that are representative of your student population and represent the diversity of your school community those that have credibility or leadership within your school or community, and the authority to make decisions or commit resources to address food offerings, physical education, access to physical activity, health education, and staff wellness. So who are these people? They are administrators, food services directors or staff, teachers, 
students. And this is a reminder that students are a really important part of your council. So don't forget about them. Nurses, school nurses that is, people from the local business community, parents, school board members, healthcare professionals, and basically anyone with an interest in creating a healthy school environment. The size and makeup of your council will vary and should align with your district or school's priorities. As you address the makeup of your council, take into consideration the roles each member will play and try to match their strengths and interests with those roles. For example, if nutrition is your district's focus, you would want to ensure your membership includes people with that interest or strength, like food services staff or school nurses. Now that we know who to ask to serve on the council, how do we sustain those members? A shared vision and mission will keep members engaged and focused. Administrative support. Having an administrative champion is, an, is a vital piece of the puzzle that will help the council move ahead towards reaching its goals. This type of support shows the council the importance of the work they are doing. Decision making process. Discuss and decide on how your council will make decisions, then consistently apply that process and consistent and effective meetings. Have established ground rules that can be referred to often. You may even want to hang them on the wall during meetings. Have a dedicated meeting time and use agendas. And consider dividing the group into smaller work groups that focus on certain priorities or action items. This encourages participation from everyone in the group and offers members the opportunity to focus in an area or areas they feel are suited to their strengths. And celebrate success. Celebrating successes big and small is a critical part of the process and will help your members stay engaged. Share these accomplishments with not only the entire council, but with the school, the district, the larger community when appropriate. For example, feature the accomplishments in a school newsletter, at a school board meeting, or even at an all-school assembly. So now that we've had a chance to talk about what a wellness council is, why it's important, and how to keep the group going, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, David Genova, to talk in more detail about his experience with wellness councils and lessons he's learned along the way. David currently serves as the district wellness coordinator at Pottstown School District. He is a graduate of Slippery Rock University, where he earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science with a concentration in Public Health and a minor in Psychology. He is a personal trainer certified through American Council on Exercise as a health coach and certified sports performance coach through Parisi Speed School. Inspired by the book Spark by John, Dr. John Rady, David has been working to establish Pottstown as a district that puts evidence-based research into practical applications, helping the students to be better learners through movement. David, we are going to pass this over to you, and the stage is yours. All right, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. I understand it's later in the day, so I, I, I do appreciate it. <clears throat> um, as we transition from uh, having trouble uh, clicking the, uh, the slides, sure thing, David here. Moment of technical difficulties. We'll be right back on with you. There we go. All right. As uh, as we transition from Mike and Allison's slides, I want you to start thinking about how you would answer the following questions and how they re relate to your wellness committee. Uh, and if you don't have a, a wellness committee in place yet, that's okay. Or a wellness council. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding. Uh, of how to do just that. So some questions that I want you to think about are, for what purpose does my committee exist? How do I know if we are successful? What concerns do I have about my committee's membership? For example, um, is my committee attending all of our monthly meetings or bi-monthly meetings? Are they attending regularly? Um, those are questions that you should be asking yourself. What's an important goal my committee is currently pursuing? And we're going to go over how to create those goals later on in the presentation. And what action should my committee implement to strengthen its effectiveness in planning work?
I'm not going to assume everybody knows the, the, the crisis and the, the epidemic that we're up against, um, but we are at a crisis point in this nation as regards to children's health and wellness, and the, and the statistics are widely known. Uh, poor dietary choices, lack of physical activity are all contributing to the epidemic rate of overweight, obese, undernourished children. This is especially true in, in uh, low, um, low income areas. Uh, just to gain some perspective on the uphill battle we're confronted by, uh, roughly 30 percent or you know, more than one in three youth are currently obese or overweight. Um, overweight children are at a higher risk for many health complications, which include type 2 diabetes, uh, elevated cholesterol levels, high blood pressure, asthma, joint problems, um, similar issues to that of an adult. Uh, not to mention overweight children are much more likely to become overweight adults, causing these complications to continue into adulthood. Um, I'm sure you've heard along the way that health experts are predicting that unless this increasing trend uh, toward overweight ceases, uh, this generation of American youth, unfortunately, may be the first to have a shorter lifespan than their parents. There's two major areas that need attention. Uh, number one is the child's diet quality. Uh, that's that's the actual quality of the foods that children eat. Uh, and it's important uh, to their growth and development. Uh, yet the majority of youth eat fewer nutrient-rich foods and consume um, and overconsume calories, uh, fat, added sugar. Uh, according to the CDC, roughly 12 million or 17 percent of nation's children slash you know, adolescents are obese. Uh, just under 80% of children ages 12 to 17 actually have a diet that needs improved. Uh, the second uh, cause of concern is, is physical activity. Um, unfortunately, in many schools, uh, physical education is becoming luxury uh, as opposed to a standard. Uh, dwindling school budgets and uh, increased federal performance requirements have many schools cutting the number of PE classes being offered. About 4% of elementary schools offer daily PE, about 8% of middle school and 2% of high schools provide daily physical, physical education. Uh, recess time is often uh, also cut in order to increase the amount of classroom instruction. Um, Less than 60% 60 per, 60 of all school districts require that elementary schools provide students with regular recess. About 85% of children travel to school by car or bus, and only 13% of children are walking or biking to school. Uh, in Pottstown, we're actually in the process of creating a $3 million plan uh, to repair sidewalks and install bike lanes throughout the town as part of an effort to establish safe routes to school. Uh, over the past two years, um, we uh, organized um, International Walk to School Day, which I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, in the picture on the slide. That's actually um, International Walk to School Day from two years ago at one of our elementary schools. Um, and we have between 600 and 700 students uh, participate in that. And that's something that we hope to continue um, once these um, sidewalks and bike lanes get implemented. It's something that we want to happen um, on a daily basis, and that's having students walk to school. Um, PE, recess, walking to school are not the only ways to offer physical activity uh, in the course of a school day. Uh, you, ha you have to get creative by implementing before, during, and after school programming. As educators, we must encourage students to become to consume nutrient-rich foods as whole grains, low-fat, uh, fat-free dairy, fresh fruits, and vegetables, uh, and to focus on achieving at least 60 minutes of physical activity every day. Uh, and that's with or without recess or, uh, or with PE.
You just you, you have to become creative, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I want you to look at our second poll, and it reads like this: uh, How often do your elementary school students have physical physical education class per week? It's something that whenever I'm out at other school districts or presenting uh, at other conferences, it's a question that I always ask because I, I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, so please select one, uh, one class per week, two classes per week, three classes per, per week, four or five classes per week, or um, your school district ended up cutting fit it, fit that and, you, and you don't have it. So go ahead. Okay, so we're looking at one class per week for a good majority of, uh, of the school districts that are out there. I actually, at, at Potsdam, we have um, phys ed at, at our elementary levels once per cycle, which we're on a six-day cycle, it's actually once per, per six days. But kudos for those school districts that have uh, PE four or five uh, classes per week. That's amazing. You can go ahead and switch that slide. So why does this matter? Why are we talking about this? Why is this gaining so much attention? Well, studies show that students with better nutrition and more physical activity have better attention spans, better class participation, a reduction in behavior problems, and higher test scores. Research also shows children who eat breakfast score higher on standardized tests than those who skip breakfast. So as you can see here on my slide, it's showing poor school performance, poor attendance, more discipline problems, more visits to the school nurse, increased risk of overweight and obese uh, children as, as well as, as an adult. Uh, rising health care costs, which is something we haven't talked about. So why are we targeting schools? Um, schools must take action and responsibility for this. Just like adults spend much of their time at work, companies are implementing workplace or corporate wellness programs. School-age children spend the majority of their time at school, so it's important that we focus on this during the time that they're at school. For example, uh, a children spends about four hours a week on homework and about 32 and a half hours per week in school. That's about seven and a half hours a week more than children did um, 20 years ago, and that's school-age children between the ages of, of uh, six and 17. Um, so they're spending about seven and a half hours more a week on academics than they did 20 years ago. Um, Solving the problems associated with childhood obesity must be a collaborative, collaborative effort of families, healthcare providers, schools, and community leaders. However, schools will play an important role in educating children and teens about healthy living and providing an environment in which they can practice these healthy behaviors throughout the school day. Uh, the Surgeon General, um, who found, who's the founding chair of Action for Healthy Kids, I believe, um, put it perfectly in this quote, schools have a unique opportunity, even the responsibility to teach and model health, healthful eating and physical activity, both in theory and in practice. Improving children's health likely improves school performance and it may even help the school's bottom line. Therefore, schools have a vested interest in improving the nutrition and increasing the physical activity of their students. If I were you, and I've done this at Pottstown, and I've surveyed teachers on whether or not they thought that implementing physical activity into their classroom was their responsibility. And uh, an, an overwhelming number of teachers agreed that yes, it was their responsibility. But this was after I kind of convinced them uh, that physical activity has a place during the school day. So what can schools do? 
Uh, well, schools are creating high-functioning wellness committees um, that promote culture of wellness among students, staff, and parents. Uh, culture of wellness in school environments um, are important in which every student can access good nutrition, re regular physical activity. Uh, these are achievable and realistic. Uh, many schools have made progress towards that goal over the past few years, uh, so it is it is doable. Um, in Pottstown, it requires a lot of players. It, it requires a support system, active promotion and communication between administrators, teachers, parents, students. Um, wellness in your buildings must be taken seriously and viewed as a priority by all staff. Uh, this starts with superintendent buy-in. Um, the way it works in Pottstown uh, is from the top-down approach. So our, it, this, this stuff, uh, as far as wellness is concerned, is a priority to our superintendent. He's made that known through everybody in the school district that, uh, that this will be addressed um, on a consistent basis. So, if it's important to our superintendent, that means it has to be important to our principals. And if it's important to our principals, uh, it has to be important to our teachers because our principals are addressing that. And if it's important to our teachers, then it has to be important to our students. So it's, it's, we've really been working from the top down, and it's, uh, and it's been very, very successful that way. Uh, the picture that's on this slide is actually uh, a wellness committee at one of our elementary schools, and we were at a conference, and uh, they're actually sitting around there uh, collaborating, communicating, and action planning. <clears throat> so Allison kind of touched on this uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, what is a school wellness committee or district council? Um, at Pottstown, our district wellness council focuses more on policy um, as well as the mission. Uh, this council is able to identify gaps and locate the district and community resources to address those gaps. Um, this group is typically larger than a school building wellness committee. Um, they might have 10 to 15 members, which includes uh, school staff, uh, but also includes community members. It might include family members and uh, and staff, or I'm sorry, and students. Uh, but what I'm mostly concerned about are our school level wellness committees. Um, so we have six buildings in our district, and each building has their own wellness committee. Um, these committees focus on the needs of the students, the families, and the staff in each specific building. Um, they're able to implement programs and activities to meet those needs. So this group is smaller, might range between five and ten members, uh, which include academic teachers, PE teachers, nurses, um, principals attend every meeting, uh, school psychologists, occupational therapists, and uh, physical therapists. So what's the role of the school wellness committee? Um, well, the wellness committees are one of the most important links in the school response to healthy eating and active living. High-functioning wellness committees monitor student health and school health environment. Notice I'm using the term high-functioning wellness committees. School districts have wellness committees. How functioning they are, I don't know. That's kind of for you to determine, and we're going to determine that. We're going to answer that question a little bit later on. Um, but you know, just because you meet monthly or bi-monthly doesn't mean that you're making uh, your school any more progressive. Um, so it's important that you're, that you're high functioning. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, a school wellness committee is essentially an advisory group uh, concerned with the health and well-being of staff and students. And it's important. Uh, that you address that this is an advisory group. This group is meant to advise, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, the Pottstown School District Wellness Committee has been created to enhance the acceptance and success of the wellness program activities by encouraging faculty and student ownership of the program. Uh, so that's also very, very important. 
um, you know, you, you, you have these committees. Um, so faculty uh, and students feel, feel ownership. They feel vested um, into wellness. So how do you ensure positive change will, will take place? So all of this is great and dandy, but how do you ensure positive change will, will take place? Uh, well, there's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, every building, every district uh, is going to be a little bit different. Uh, however, I put together seven steps that I believe is important when trying to make a positive change in your school or your district. Um, as we move along, I'll provide you with practical step-by-step -step approaches to putting uh, your school wellness committee into action. Included are areas of strategies for improving both nutrition and physical activity environments of your school, uh, as well as practical examples from Pottstown schools. So the seven steps that I created is, of course, number one, form a wellness committee. Um, after that, you know, creating group norms. Communicate with stakeholders. Start developing partnerships. Assessing your school wellness environment, which we're going to address. Uh, create an action plan. Prioritize um, you know, what's most important. Select your goals for the school year. Uh, and evaluate progress. So step one. Um, is to form and maintain a school wellness committee. You want to gather interested people, um, people that have a similar interest in health and wellness, uh, that have a sincere desire to help students and enhance their quality of life, um, are committed to helping, the pop, uh, helping your school district uh, succeed. Um, faculty, staff who are well, well, well respected by their peers and, and students. And of course, uh, having the availability to do so. Um, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have committee members that may, that might be involved with, you know, various other committees or have other commitments. Um, you want to make sure that they're able to meet um, at least monthly, uh, bi-monthly uh, as well. Um, you know, you want to review the purpose and the function and the responsibilities of the School Wellness Committee. Um, the purpose is so that they can communicate with other faculty and students uh, what they are thinking and feeling and saying uh, in regards to student and faculty wellness. Um, they can communicate to the faculty and students what the wellness program is all about and why they should be involved. Uh, they can communicate uh, or they can help staff events, distribute materials, collect tracking forms um, that might be used for evaluating purposes. Um, they might be there to speak to other employee groups. You know, they should really be the arms, the legs, the eyes, and ears of the program um, so they can provide valuable, valuable insights. Some of the responsibilities uh, that they might have is to assist with program planning. Um, they need to be able to actively promote the program activities among students and faculty. They need to provide uh, feedback to the wellness champion um, about your own thoughts, ideas, and suggestions and those of faculty and students. Now, the wellness champion needs to be somebody who, um, you know, Maybe maybe somebody who would be elected by by your committee. Now I'm the wellness champion of of each of the the wellness committees at at our district. But you're going to want somebody that you can rely on, somebody uh, you know your go-to person, your leader, so to speak. <clears throat> if you don't have buy-in from your administrators, from your superintendent it might be a good idea uh, to prepare a proposal for those administrators. Because if you want people, uh, staff, and students to take this seriously, 
all right, you're going to need support and you're going to need buy-in from your administrators. And if you don't have that, you have to get that. And you have to do whatever it takes to get that, whether it's you know, coming up with a proposal, showing them research that's been done in other school districts with similar demographics. Um, you, you know, and, and if, they, if they shoot you down, ask why and come up with something else um, to present them. But you, you have to have that administrative and even school board buy-in before you can really uh, be successful. Step two is creating group norms. Just like, uh, just like any wellness or any committee that you're a part of, a good one has group norms. Um, meetings will uh, start and end on time. Um, norms and ground rules help create culture and set the tone for meetings. Uh, these norms should be shaped and agreed upon and enforced by the wellness committee. Group norms can be changed if they aren't working. Uh, setting norms will ensure that wellness committees are effective and enjoyable. Um, so it's important that meetings will start and end on time. At Pottstown, our wellness committees happen before school starts for about 30 minutes. Um, you have to send out the agenda beforehand. I would send it out at least a week beforehand so that the committee um, can review it and come to the meetings with, with questions. Um, everything else is pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, the last bolded item, though, is probably uh, the most important one out of them all, and that's to have fun. If, you're, uh, committee, if, if you expect your committee members to stick around um, and be engaged and have high attendance and good participation, they have to have fun. So um, make sure that that happens one way or another. Step three is to communicate with stakeholders. Um, inform all stakeholders within your school community as to why, uh, as to the why behind forming a wellness committee. Uh, once the why is clearly communicated, many good things will happen. Um, in, interested individuals will emerge, both from in your school district, uh, as well as people from without, from within the community. Um, and I'm currently seeing that. Uh, here in Pasta, and, and it's great. I mean, the collaborative environment that we have going here um, is, is just, it, it, it's wonderful. Everybody's kind of on the same page. We all have our same uh, similar missions. Uh, the entire school community uh, and outside uh, the school will share common knowledge on school wellness change. Some things to consider when communicating about school wellness. Well, it's important that you convey factual information on changes and trends relative to the well-being of your students. Provide stakeholders with relevant information as to why schools, school is an appropriate venue for addressing issues of wellness in children and teens. We talked about that earlier, about how the majority of students spend their time at school, so it's just, it, it, it's appropriate, it's our responsibility. Um, provide a wellness overview at in-person gatherings. Um, any opportunity that you can talk about wellness in front of staff and, and students and parents, I suggest you do that. Uh, they can be at, at staff meetings. Uh, they can be at board meetings. It's super important that you keep teachers and administrators up to date. And don't be afraid to share success. Uh, people want to hear that stuff. It's what's going to keep your committee going. Um, you can share at PTA or PTO meetings. Let parents know why student wellness is important, um, and it's important to academic achievement. Um, I think most parents probably understand uh, that wellness is important to, you know, for being physically active and, and eating a well-balanced diet, but what a lot of parents don't understand is the importance uh, that it gives to uh, academic achievement. Um, and even talk at student, student assemblies. Uh, I've done that before, too. <clears throat> so step four is assessing your school wellness environment. Uh, there's a lot of schools, a lot of companies that are afraid to assess what it is that you're doing. But without doing that, how do you know if what you're doing is successful or not? 
Right out of the starting gate, it's important to know where your school district stands compared to other requirements of the new school wellness policy. By doing this, your school wellness committee will have a clear starting point for making change. The school health index is based on the coordinated school health model developed by the CDC for improving student health and learning. The school health index measures how well schools address eight components of student health. And that's what we use. Um, actually, we've used various uh, assessments, but the one I would recommend is the school health index assessment, which I have the link right here for you. First, you have to choose when ass what assessment is most appropriate for your goals. I would imagine you want to start something that has to do with physical activity, nutrition, staff wellness, maybe community wellness. Um, then decide how you're going to administer it. Are you going to have one person complete it uh, or your wellness committee or subcommittee to complete different areas? For example, your food service director might complete the nutrition section of um, the school health index, whereas your phys ed teacher might complete the physical activity portion of it. Um, would you want to include students, depending if you're elementary or secondary, might help to have a student's perspective. Um, after conducting the assessment, meet with your committee to discuss the results. Figure out your student, your school strengths and weaknesses. Uh, after that, you're going to want to determine the areas to address. How can you turn those weaknesses into strengths, and how can how can you continue to build on your strengths? So don't ignore those. You want to you want to continue building upon um, you know uh, what you're doing well on. So create an action plan would probably be the next step. And an action plan is a way to make sure your wellness committee's vision is made concrete. It describes the way your group will use its strategies to meet its objectives. Each action step should include the following inf information. What actions or changes will occur? Who will carry out these changes? What resources, such as money or staff, are needed to carry out these changes? And communication. Who should know what? Communication is huge. We're going to go over that again in a little bit, too. Ideally, an action plan should be created after you've determined your vision, your mission, your objectives, and strategies of your wellness committee. Remember, though, that an action plan is always a work in progress. It will be very difficult to do what you're saying you're going to do without an action plan. Try to stay organized and stick to a timeline the best you can. The more organized you are, the more fluid um, everything's going to be throughout the school year. Step six is to prioritize. Evaluate the action, evaluate the action plan you developed in step five. How many high priority item, items were there? Um, I would suggest, and this is what I did, uh, when I got to Pottstown, um, and that I selected one to three items uh, to set as goals for the coming school year. Uh, I would recommend starting small and create a positive reputation in your district. Remember to not bite off more than you can chew. It, that's a perfect uh, analogy for this uh, specific example. Uh, so I like to use uh, smart actually smarter goals. Um, the S is specific. Uh, state exactly what you want to achieve. Uh, make sure it's measurable. Establish clear definitions to help you recognize whether you're reaching your goal. <clears throat> Attainable means outline exactly what steps you will take to accomplish your goal. Um, R is, is relevant or results-oriented. Set goals you can accomplish. Uh, remember those one to three goals. Be sure to consider obstacles you may need to overcome, such as um, lack of staff or lack of funding. Uh, decide exactly when you'll start and when you'll finish. And um, whatever initiatives, items, or goals your committee members organize, make sure there's enthusiasm uh, among your committee. And of course, um, reevaluate, reassess what it is that you're doing and provide rewards uh, for student participation or staff involvement. 
Step seven is to evaluate progress of each school wellness activity. This is not something that should be overlooked. Evaluation is critical to assessing your schools and districts wellness initiatives. Meaningful evaluations improve the specific content, documents, uh, documents environmental changes, uh, staffing needs, and changes in venue. Evaluations ensure that your, that your programs are on course and leads an ident identification of new and changing needs. Evaluations of your school wellness committees can be boiled down to one major line of attack. It's all about putting in place a systematic approach to collecting information. This information will then provide insight as to, well, to how well your school is doing or your district is, is doing with its wellness activities. The best time to put your evaluation plan into place is before you implement a new wellness activity. With this approach, you can easily include baseline information in order to best track the impact of your activity. For example, when you want to evaluate the success, or when Pottstown um, wanted to evaluate the success of our morning brain stimulation videos, which are basically uh, videos done right when school started for 10 minutes, uh, our elementary school kids, every, every student, every class, every teacher was participating in 10 minutes of physical activity uh, right when school started. So we wanted to collect, um, uh, we wanted to collect data on that. So we made sure all the players that were involved uh, were kept in the loop and we knew what goals, um, what our goals were and what we were trying to achieve. We wanted to track uh, data on behavior such as office referrals, out of school, out of school suspensions, in school suspensions, attendance, and DIBBLE scores, as well as BMI. Um, so, by keeping these players uh, involved in, and in the loop, nobody was caught off, uh, caught by surprise. Um, academic and PE teachers, office staff, principals, nurses, each had their own responsibilities as far as collecting the data. Then midway through the year, we reconvened and shared the data that we collected, and then we did it again at the end of the year. At your first meeting, determine roles, um, just like any committee. Determine roles as to who's going to be the facilitator, who's going to be the record uh, keeper, who's going to track minutes. These roles, once assigned, may involve you know, greater time commitment down the road, uh, so you, but you can also rotate these committee responsibilities throughout the school year. As you work with your wellness committees, you'll need to make decisions or recommendations um, discussing how your group will make decisions is important for keeping the work you do together uh, moving forward. Knowing ahead of time of how decisions will be made can potentially eliminate or uh, eliminate conflicts or, or questions. So what I mean by um, you know, deciding how your committee will make decisions, will it be a democratic decision, one person, one vote, or a consensus decision, seeking uh, agreement from the majority of the participants or committee members? So, you need to establish who you are. Um, does every wellness council, every commission or committee have a mission statement? But this is something that actually Pottstown is working on. We have a, a wellness council mission statement, but we're in the middle of creating uh, mission statements for each committee in each building. <clears throat> um, if you have a mission statement, do you know what your mission statement is? If you don't, do you know where you can find it? Um, in my view, knowing and understanding your mission statement is one of the most underutilized strategies in guiding your wellness committee into the future. After all, if you don't know where you came from, um, you're going to have a difficult time knowing where you're going. <clears throat> so what should your mission statement look like? Uh, keep that in mind. Um, and this can change uh, over time. Once you, once you create a mission statement, 
uh, that mission statement can be create, can be um, you know looked at again and and adjusted accordingly. So, what type of strategies make your wellness committee successful? Number one, there has to be a clear purpose for why you have your wellness committee. Number two, uh, the group is self-conscious about its own operation. Number three, the group has clear performance goals, um, so you should be action planning and knowing uh, what those goals are and making sure that they're realistic and, and achievable. Um, <clears throat> make sure your atmosphere at your committee meetings tends to be, you want it to be informal, you want it to be comfortable, you want it to be relaxed, you want people to have fun and, uh, and make sure that they're comfortable enough to be able to share their own thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Um, there's also uh, encourage a lot of discussion, a lot of thought in which everybody participates. Uh, don't discourage anyone from sharing their ideas. That's not, uh, not a good way to go about things. And make sure each individual carries his or her own weight. So assign responsibilities. Uh, don't be afraid to delegate. Remember, these people that are part of your committee want to be there. Nobody's holding their hand forcing them to be there. So make sure that you utilize that. Make sure everybody's carrying their own weight. So what makes a wellness committee dysfunctional or unable to move forward? Um, pretty much opposite of what we just talked about. There's no leadership. There's nobody there uh, willing to head this committee, uh, willing to really take control. Um, nobody's established responsibilities. Everybody's just kind of doing things on their own. There's no, no clear-cut responsibilities. Uh, there's no support. There's no communication. Um, I've seen this with other, with other committees, and people are pointing fingers. Well, he said he was going to do this. She said she was going to do that. Make sure you, you file uh, meeting minutes uh, and distribute those to committee members to make sure that they understand what it is you expect of them. Um, they have a difficult time making the decisions. They can't agree on anything. Uh, conflicts are, are common in, uh, in committees. Uh, that are dysfunctional. So just to recap on, uh, on this presentation, administrative support is crucial. I cannot address that enough. A shared vision and mission uh, needs to be addressed. Make sure you establish agreed upon clear goals. Communication we just talked about. Decision making. Effective meetings. And don't forget to celebrate su success. Share that success any way you can. Share your success with students, with other faculty, with parents, with the school board, with other administrators. People want to hear this stuff. Don't be afraid uh, to celebrate. And I do have a little bit of homework for you guys to think about after this presentation. What I want you to do, maybe starting, you know, start collecting these thoughts, but maybe at the beginning of, of the new year, you know, start creating a list of school wellness committee members or members uh, that could potentially be a part of your committee. And if, and if you don't know of any, put signage, put, uh, put up posters, put up flyers, emails um, to start gathering those people. Um, gather, you know, write down their name, their title, their, their email. Um, once you have that, Select a, uh, select a committee leader. Um, set up a school wellness, uh, set up your school wellness council or committee meetings. Um, start recording meeting minutes uh, and create uh, your wellness committee portfolio. Keep track of all your meeting minutes, uh, your needs assessment, your action plans, communication with parents, students, faculty, and staff whether it's through phone or email, save that stuff. Um, save stuff that's been used in the press, uh, such as newspapers, uh, articles, and, uh, and use photos. Um, sharing a visual, I think, can be a little bit maybe more effective than words. So those are some just some things to think about.
And uh, if you have any questions, now would be a great time. Thank you, David. Uh, we had a few come through already. And to give you a break from talking, I think Allie and I are going to try tackling one of them so far. Um, the question that came through was, you mentioned inviting students to participate. Do you have any suggestions to improve student participation? Uh, one thing we kind of recommend based on our, our resource, the Alliance for Healthier Generation, is when dealing with students is to be clear about roles and expectations, create multiple student positions on the council, give them some kind of buddies on the council so they don't feel like they're sitting there and with a bunch of teachers if, and uh, admins that they may or may not feel uh, like they can have an, an honest uh, discussion with. Provide skill building opportunities to increase participation. Let them be vocal. Let them be leaders in the school district. Uh, let them go solicit participation from their other students and find out what's really going on and bring that back to you. Uh, definitely take the time to show them how the students fit into the action plan. Uh, some, some focuses are staff and uh, student focus, but definitely to get them on board, just show them how they can help and how this will benefit the student population as a whole. Always important to celebrate successes. And again, allow them a little bit of a leadership role with their peers. Make, make other students want to be in that position after these students are gone. Uh, another option really is to allow students to create their own wellness council. And they could kind of have a liaison that will attend district wellness council meetings. That way, if there is that kind of weird disconnect between students, staff, teachers, then they could just kind of serve and send a message back and forth. Uh, just to piggyback that. Um, now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to do this, but in Pottstown, uh, with student participation, whether it's in, in a wellness committee or something else, uh, we've actually had teachers give extra credit to those students uh, who are going kind of above and beyond uh, what's expected of them. Um, we've also done, uh, now that's something that you're probably going to want to uh, make sure your superintendent and principal uh, support that decision before you start giving them extra credit for those things. But uh, it's a possibility. Um, maybe incentivize those students um, who are taking time out of their day to be part of a wellness committee meeting. Uh, incentivize them through field trips, through t-shirts, through, um, you know, whatever. Whatever you have on hand. Frisbees or um, something that has to deal with wellness, you know, taking them out to lunch, you know, something like that. Uh, but incentives, just showing them that, that, uh, that you recognize um, that, that they're trying to improve the health of themselves as well as um, their fellow classmates. Thank you, David. Totally in agreement here with you uh, at Pro Wellness Center. Uh, we're running a little close to the deadline, so I say we take maybe one more question and then we'll close it up. And I know this one's directed towards you, David. It is, how does Pottstown fund the position of wellness coordinator? I think it's hmm. pretty critical going forward. I know that you have a unique situation, so I'll let you take that one. OK, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I started uh, in May of 2012 uh, working 10 hours a week. I actually found the position in a newspaper. Uh, I was working as a personal trainer at the time, and I gave it a shot and I, I ended up getting the job and it was a, a 10 hour week grant funded position and I really really enjoyed what I was doing so I started working more and more and more and even though I was only funded for 10 hours a week um, it didn't matter I was pretty much volunteering at that point uh, but administrators started taking notice of what it was that I was doing and they asked me to the, the following year. So last year was my first year here full time. So I went from 10 hours a week to uh, being here full time. And last year it was supported by, uh, by a grant again. Um, and then this year is my second year here full time. Half of my salary is coming from the school district. Half of it's coming from a grant. Uh, starting next school year, as of now, I will be um, fully. You know, the, the district will be will be picking up my salary 100%. Thank you, David. I think that was a great example of how to kind of build interest in district. Look for that opportunity as a grant funded position, and then show them how important you are. And I think you did an excellent job with that. Uh, 
I, that's pretty much all the time we have for today. However, any answers that didn't, we didn't get to, uh, we'll definitely post them on our website, as well as a few other resources. Uh, we have just a few resources here. One is David's uh, Pottstown School District Facebook page, as well as our few most reputable resources that we have on, on hand. This will also be on the website, as well as a one-page handout. And uh, here's our information. If you have any more questions, you can uh, reach us anytime during email. Uh, or just check us out on our website at www.pennstatehershey.org slash prowellness. And again, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, David, for an excellent job talking about school wellness councils. Thank you. I appreciate it.